How dangerous is the air around us? Every time we speak, every time we laugh or sing, we emit particles. And once they're there, they linger. We know that this is a key way that coronavirus can spread. Scientists are still assessing how dangerous these doses of airborne virus can be and what we can do to avoid them. Opening a window is one way to keep the air fresh, but by keeping the air moving with systems like air conditioning, are we decreasing the risk or merely spreading it? What do we need to do to breathe easily indoors? And this is DW's COVID-19 special. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Stephen Beardsley in Berlin. Open the window. It's the one piece of advice we're all hearing now. That's a bit more complicated in the winter, doesn't work in all rooms, and certainly doesn't work on airplanes. The aviation industry says cabin air is sufficiently filtered and circulated, though some experts say questions remain. For air travelers, social distancing already starts to get difficult at the boarding gate. And it gets even trickier on the plane. Spacing out just isn't possible, unless you can afford to buy an extra seat. With only 50 centimeters distance between each person, the risk of infection is obvious. Inhaling the droplets and aerosols from an adjacent passenger seems unavoidable. Scientists have long been aware of the dangers of infection on planes, mostly because of studies of other coronaviruses. Air is not displaced in aircraft. Air inlets and outlets are too small for that. Cabin air can only be mixed. Over at the Hamburg University of Applied Sciences, Professor Dieter Schultz says viruses may stay in the cabin air for up to 15 minutes, exposing passengers to infection risk. The aviation industry makes three claims. Firstly, filters in aircraft make the air as clean as an operating room. Secondly, the air is completely exchanged every two to three minutes. Thirdly, the air only moves from top to bottom in the cabin. All three are just not true. It could be that current safety standards and filtration techniques are not as good as many may think meaning the possibility of catching coronavirus when flying could be more up to chance than anything else. Let's take a closer look at ventilation and the virus. Joining me now is Paul Linden. He's a professor of fluid mechanics at Cambridge University. Paul, it's good to have you on the show. Um, let's start with the obvious question. Winter is approaching in, northern, in the northern hemisphere. What's the best thing that someone should keep in mind about ventilation in rooms? Well, it's obviously a challenge the winter because uh, the tendency is to close up uh, buildings and uh, ventilation is reduced to keep warm. So the best thing to do is to make sure that uh, as much ventilation as, as possible is achieved. Open a window if you possibly can. Um, and if you have a mechanical system, make sure it has as much fresh air coming in as possible. What about fans? What if I just have fans that are standing around in the room? Does that help keep things ventilated? Does that help me at all? No, it doesn't. It'll just mix up what's already there. Um, and uh, that's probably not the best thing, um, because if there is a uh, virus uh, particles in the in the air um, and it's stirred all around, your chances of breathing them are increased. Um, so I wouldn't uh, recommend using fans. OK, so the best option then, it seems to be, is to keep the window open, even though it's when it's winter or at least to open it periodically. Um, of course, that's going to mean that people are going to be colder, rooms are going to be colder. Is this really a choice now that we have between uh, climate control and being safe with the virus? Is it such a, a black and white choice? Pretty much, I would say it is. That's right. And um, um, it's uh, well known that uh, during the Spanish flu, um, Classes in the U.S., even in the Midwest in the winter, were held outside. So it's, um, mm. it, yeah, I think it is a... It is a trade-off between staying warm and staying safe. That's got to mean quite a change for the industry, the climate control, HVAC, um, air conditioning industry. Yes, absolutely, uh, it will. And um, I mean, conventional systems uh, use uh, a certain amount of recirculated air and they supplement that with some fresh air um, when it's uh, pumped or ducted through the building. And again, you want to make sure that uh, the 
proportion of fresh air is as high as possible. Mm. And that will, in a climate controlled situation, mean, of course, that more energy is used to keep that, to warm that air up. Um, so it'll be a trade off there between between energy costs uh, and um, and the amount of fresh air that you can provide. And then one of your studies, you mentioned carbon dioxide, of course, being a, an indicator as well. Um, does this mean that we can expect that carbon dioxide uh, mm. measurers will be a more common feature in rooms? Yeah, I believe that's uh, a very sensible thing to do. Um, carbon dioxide is essentially within a building uh, produced by people exhaling um, and so levels that are above the background outside values of about 400 and something past per million uh, are indic indicative of uh, air that's been in someone's lungs and then breathed out again um, and so measuring that gives you a, a, an estimate in fact you can relate the risk of infection directly to uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide help me understand draw a picture when I enter a room, I'm breathing, speaking, laughing, with, without a mask. What am I seeing or what are you seeing if you're able to see these, these plumes or whatever you call them? Yeah, so uh, from an individual, uh, you give off uh, heat. Um, every person gives off about 80 watts, so a bit like a light, fairly bright light bulb. Um, <laughs> and that heat uh, rises uh, from your body in a what we call a turbulent plume. Um, and that will rise up towards the ceiling. And you know that in most rooms, the air near the ceiling is warmer than the air near the floor. Also, plumes arise from equipment like a computer or other things. Um, and, uh, and when you breathe out, you also breathe out warm air. Um, that warm air is directed, of course, uh, in, in different directions. So if you breathe through your nose, it's directed downwards. If you breathe, if you talk, um, uh, it goes much more horizontally, um, and of course, it depends on the sounds that you make. Some sounds uh, eject air uh, further, and the heart, louder you speak, the further it goes. So there's a very complex dynamical process going on, and it's invisible. That's quite right. We have techniques that make it possible to visualize this, um, and we use those techniques, which essentially look at the way the refractive index of the air changes. It's a bit like watching the air shimmer above a toaster. Mm. If you look at your toaster one day, and um, you'll see that. It's the same process, and we can visualize that, and we can see where this goes. And what we do see is that if you wear a mask, for example, that the air that you exhale uh, even when you're speaking or even laughing and coughing, uh, tends to uh, basically leak around the, the edges of the mask, mostly around the nose where it doesn't mm. fit properly. Um, and that then gets carried up with the plume in your body, and that's a good thing. So, that, so wearing a mask generally uh, confines your breath to, to be taken up with the hot air rising from you. It's more complicated if you're walking around, on the other hand, because then you have a wake behind you, just as you would um, mm. a wake behind a ship. Uh, and, uh, and that wake, uh, you carry uh, your breath in the wake behind you. Um, so you can spread it around quite significantly. So those flows are much more vigorous than the flow produced by your ventilation system. Unless you're very close to, say, an open window, mm. you probably don't perceive the movement around you. Um, so those flows are re relatively weak. The flow from your heat from your body when you speak, when you breathe in and out, they're much stronger. And, they're, and so it's a complicated interaction between those flows and the general tendency of hot air to rise and air to be taken in and out through whatever right. openings you have in your, in your building. All right, we'll have to leave it there for now. It sounds like a fascinating time to be a professor of fluid mechanics. Paul Linden joins us from Brilliant. Cambridge University. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now it's time for your questions. It's the part of the show where our science correspondent, Derek Williams, answers the questions you've posted to our YouTube channel. Over to Derek. If a number of vaccines come out at the same time, would it harm you to take multiple different vaccines? In light of how quickly things are moving on the vaccine front, this is an important question to ask. Uh, for example, there have been reports that China is apparently already giving tens of thousands of doses to people there, 
of vaccine candidates that haven't yet completed widespread safety and efficacy testing. Um, observers are seriously alarmed by that because it sets the stage for a range of frightening possible scenarios. Uh, what happens, for instance, if the vaccine doesn't prevent infection as well as hoped and, and those people have to be vaccinated again at some point with other candidates? Uh, could that be dangerous for them? The short answer is, once again, we don't know, uh, but possibly. Uh, vaccines can have adverse effects even when just one is administered. That's why they're tested so widely before being approved for the general public. And with dozens of different candidates out there based on a number of different platforms, there are a lot of possible combinations with the potential to go wrong if people start being given more than one vaccine or, or given them in haphazard, undocumented ways. Um, until we actually do it, there's no way to rule out that giving vaccines in combination or in a series could pose a danger, which is why it's best to exhaustively check every vaccine candidate for safety and efficacy in advance so that in a best case scenario, we only have to vaccinate everyone once. Our science correspondent Derek Williams there. And before we let you go, here's another look at how people are adapting to life in the pandemic. In this case, by socially distancing within a crowd. Live music has returned to Rio de Janeiro, but many dance floors and open air concert spaces now feature spaced out boxes of up to six people each. Music fans there say it's important for their mental health to be able to let loose while hopefully staying safe. And that's it for our COVID-19 special. We hope that you stay safe and join us next time. Thanks for watching.